In this video, I just want to think for a few minutes about the issue of texture. So, you know, what do we mean by texture? Because people are sometimes a little bit kind of vague about this, you know, and what's texture and what's timbre, you know, these are words that are floated about, but sometimes not very clearly defined. Well, timbre is more about things like instrumental sound, you know, if I've got this melody, is it best suited to the sound of the oboe or the sound of the trumpet? Or is it best played on strings or whatever, you know, so that's really kind of about timbre. And also also just kind of even within a single instrument, what's the difference in timbre between playing something at the top end of the register, the bottom end of the register, the middle of the register, changing registers, all that kind of stuff that adds to the kind of colour of individual instrumental sound. Texture, I like to think of it in this way, you know, how is the overall sound being organised? So what do I mean by that? Well, in other words, are we thinking in homophonic terms? In other words, are we going from one chord to the next? So even if I float a melody over the top of that, I'm still kind of progressing from chord to chord. Okay, so that's a homophonic texture. Well, what about a more polyphonic texture? In other words, where we're thinking in a more linear way, where maybe one part begins and another part comes in and they have a kind of conversation with each other and then you might add more parts. So you might be thinking, actually, when I'm writing my song, is it entirely homophonic? Songs often are. Um, or is there an opportunity somewhere during my song to have something that's a bit more polyphonic to kind of vary the texture? There's also the whole thing about, well, how is my sound organised in terms of its pitch? Is it high? Is it low? Is it in the middle? Is it widely spaced? So I've got high sounds, I've got low sounds, and I've got space in the middle. You know, maybe I want to do a bit of that to leave the singer in the middle. So there's a kind of clarity about the vocal line with the accompaniment kind of working either side of it. I mean, it's one possibility. So high and low. You might also think of it in terms of thick or thin. In other words, you know, have I just got one unaccompanied line? Have I got two parts, three parts, four parts? Have I got chords that maybe have got seven or eight different pictures in them? And, and how am I varying the texture? Am I writing a song that's exactly the same all the way through? Or am I trying to vary it? Or am I running the risk of varying it too much? So I get a couple of bars of this and a couple of measures of that and a couple of bars of something else. And we don't really know how this whole thing hangs together. So just thinking about how the sound is organised is an aspect of composing a song that is worth giving some thought to. So let's just sort of have a little think about how this might apply in practice. So I've just taken, you know, a text that we know and love, the sun is fading, and I'm just setting it in a very simple way. So version A of this is simply the line being unaccompanied. Okay, so the sun is fading. Now you might think, actually, that's got the potential to be quite atmospheric, isn't it? Just to finish a song, maybe, the sun fading, without any accompaniment at all, just the voice on its own. That could be a really effective thing to do. It could make for an effective start to a song. It could be that you've had a quite a busy, thick texture, and somewhere in the middle of the song, you just want to stop and then just have this single line. Now, whether it's the vocal line or whether it's an instrumental line, always worth thinking about, is there any scope in your song to have some element of unaccompanied, just a single line? Because it's often a, a great opportunity for atmosphere that, that is missed. So there we are, that's the first one, just a very simple idea of an unaccompanied line. Well, let's look at what I've labelled texture B here. I'm doing exactly the same vocal phrase. This time I'm using block chords and I'm just tracking the vocal line. So in the accompaniment, you can see the vocal line 
is sitting at the top of the accompaniment and I've just literally got chords supporting that. So how does this sound then? So now I've got the sun is fading. So yeah, that's a fairly standard way of doing things, isn't it? And you can think about where your chords are going to change and all the rest of it, but it's essentially a homophonic texture, block chord supporting the line with the line at the top of the accompaniment. It's one thing to think about. Do you always want to track the vocal line somewhere in the accompaniment? Uh, do you want to keep the accompaniment entirely independent of the vocal line? Do you want to mix and match? Often a bit of mixing and matching is quite nice to do. A lot depends on how thickly you want to score things as well. I mean, if you want to orchestrate a song, well, then you've got all sorts of possibilities, haven't you, for an instrument to double a vocal line and then switch to a different instrument there, have passages where it doesn't double. Anything that just gives you a nice variety of colour. Well, let's have a look at possibility C. And again, these uh, varied textures are not exhaustive. I'm just kind of helping to inspire a little bit of imaginative thinking with, oh, actually, how could I vary textures within my songs? So what am I thinking about here? Well, this time I'm just thinking about a two-part texture with a kind of duet sort of formation. So this time the singer sings a line and an instrument of your choice, whatever that might be, is just doing a kind of counter melody. So I've got the original, the sun is fading. And then I'm just trying to write another kind of melody that duets with it for an instrument. And I'm trying to get a kind of nice balance with the vocal line. So the vocal line is kind of coming down. You can see the instrumental line is basically climbing. So there's a little bit of kind of movement, contrary motion. You'll notice as well that sometimes the rhythm is in common between the vocal line and the instrumental line. Sometimes the rhythm is independent. So because I've got a dotted rhythm there, I'm thinking let's not have a dotted rhythm here. So something slightly different happens. Because I've got a long note here in the voice, well, let's get a bit busier in the instrumental part. And that will enhance this sense of duet going on. So we end up with something that goes like this. And the sun is fading. So just a little kind of snippet of duet writing. I mean, you could extend that onto a, a bigger canvas if you wanted to. Or again, it could just be a very effective minimalist finish to a song, couldn't it? You know, if you think, well, I don't want to just have it unaccompanied, but I might want to do something like this. So another possibility and something that's maybe just a little bit more polyphonic, a little bit more linear in design. I mean, if you write something that's a bit more polyphonic, you still make, need to make sure that it, it kind of makes sense from a point of view of chords. I mean, I'm writing polyphonic lines, but I'm still thinking, well, this is basically chord four or a chord of F. This is chord five or a chord of G. And then this is basically chord one or a chord of C, maybe a touch of four or a chord of F there and coming back to a chord of C. So there's still harmonic thinking behind it, but essentially what you're hearing are these two linear lines. Okay, well, what else could we do? Here I've got in version D, what I've called an accumulating texture. Uh, with a degree of imitation. So what do I mean by that? Well, you can see here, the voice starts on its own. So the first couple of notes, unaccompanied. Then, you know, this is scored for piano, but it could be for any other instruments. Then when we get to this point, the left hand of the piano comes in. So a second voice enters. And then at this point, the right hand comes in. So a third voice enters. It sort of accumulates, doesn't it? And when I say a degree of imitation, you can see that the vocal line is doing this. As it's done before. Then if you listen to the bass line, it's not identical, but it's a bit similar.
So that's what I mean, a degree of imitation. It, when, when we talk about imitation, people often sort of think it's got to be absolutely strict imitation. So whatever I've written here, I've got to copy exactly there. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes your imitation can be a little bit kind of loose, can't it? And even things like I've got three descending notes in the bass at the beginning here uh, with a couple of quavers, a couple of eighth notes, followed by a, a quarter note, a crotchet note. I've done the same rhythm in the right hand in the next bar, the next measure, with different pitches, but still three descending notes. So, you know, and things like the last two notes of the voice are a repeated note, while the last two notes in the accompaniment are repeated notes, but coming at a different point. So you see how it kind of integrates a little bit with this accumulating texture with a degree of imitation. So how does this come across? The sun is fading. Okay. Again, you might be thinking, well, that's all very well if you're going to write in that kind of style. I'm not writing in that style, so how does that apply to me? Well, it applies equally because you could do this in any style you want. This is the thing I want to keep kind of nailing home, really. This is all about picking up techniques and then thinking, right, how do I take that to the style in which I'm writing? Okay, and uh, in this version, uh, version E, I've got another possibility, you know, sparse chords, I've called this widely spaced. So it's just sort of thinking of, well, what are my alternatives? So here I'm doing something with block chords, but actually this is relatively high, this is relatively low, and that pattern is continued into the, the next bar, the next measure. Um, but quite a lot of notes. I mean, you know, what am I doing here? I've got a six part chord, haven't I? I had a six part chord there. But I'm being a bit sparse, you know, I'm allowing the vocal line to carry on and I'm just punctuating it by just adding a chord on the second beat of one bar and starting a chord on the second beat of the next bar. So you don't have to think for every single note in the melody, I've got to have a new chord kind of crashing away um, underneath it. It can be quite effective. The sun is fading. You can sort of hear, can't you, that, uh, that that's just a kind of minimalist approach to the accompaniment, but it's working quite nicely. Alternatively, you could do something like this, which is the opposite, where the accompaniment is actually quite busy. So in the last one, the accompaniment was quite sparse. You know, when you, when you look at this one down here, there are kind of, you know, as many rests as there are notes, aren't there? When you look at this, you're sort of thinking, goodness, what's all this going on here? Notes going everywhere. But I'm taking a chord pattern that, that fits with this particular fragment, and I'm thinking, how can I kind of get busy in the accompaniment so the accompaniment is going faster than the voice? So it's not the voice that's generating kind of momentum now, that's coming from the accompanying stuff. So the right hand of this piano part as it stands, um, it's not doing anything profoundly melodic, it's just being kind of busy with the rhythm and it's kind of outlining notes that belong to the chords. So I've now got an accompaniment that does this. <laughs> So you see how that's working, yeah. Okay, um, so it would do this with the voice. The sun is fading. Get the idea, I don't know why I've put a dot in the left hand there, it shouldn't be there. Anyway, um, you can see what's going on. All I'm trying to do here is to say, well, you know, we've explored six different possibilities for texture just by looking at one little fragment. So whatever your songwriting style is, you know, have a little think about, you know, this is something maybe to think about after you've kind of composed the basic song. Just thinking, okay, what am I doing with textures? How much do I want to vary them in this song? When I look at the lyrics, the words, am I thinking, yeah, actually there's a kind of movement there, an emotional movement, or uh, the idea is moving in a new direction. That could be a good point at which to change the texture. Or that's a particularly poignant moment. So is that a moment where I could be a bit sparse with those chords? Or just leave the voice unaccompanied? Or do that little kind of duet idea with 
one instrument. Um, when I'm wanting to kind of build a kind of speed momentum to something, well, can I get busy with this figuration idea? You know, can I think about what's homophonic, what's polyphonic? Think about how I'm relating to the voice with everything else that I'm writing around it. Am I tracking the vocal line? Am I being independent of the vocal line? Am I doing a bit of both? You know, all of this will really add variety to the impact of the song. So don't overdo the variety would be my advice, but make sure you've got enough variety to really kind of put the icing on the cake of the central idea that you've already written.